Hey, it's Kathy Olislag with Journey into Cybersecurity. I have my partner in crime with me, Antonio Chauza, and we have an awesome guest, Nathan Hicks. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for being on our podcast with us, uh, Nathan. You Can I call you Nate? Is that okay? Yeah, no, please and thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, Nate, tell us who you are, what you do, and let's yeah. get there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, my name is uh, Nate Hicks or Nathan Hicks. Um, Nate, for short, usually. Um, currently, right now, um, I'm a manager of a threat operations group um, at a payments processing company. Um, just the general caveat, anything that I say on a podcast uh, doesn't represent my employer. I just got to give the, the, the few words before I start. Uh, but yeah, my name is Nathan Hicks. Uh, I've been doing security about uh, a little bit more than a decade now, actually, um, than I have been recently. So I've been doing it a little bit more than a decade, um, very much centered around the uh, operations aspect of security. So the inner workings of uh, technology, security, um, how they get used every day. Um, it's definitely what I've had my hands in the most over the course of that 10 years. Um, I live in West Virginia. Uh, I'm married. Um, I've got a beautiful wife. Her name's Sarah. Um, I've got a home and a dog and a cat. Um, I am a horror movie fanatic, uh, <laughs> as you can see. Um, yeah, that's that's a general synopsis, I would say. Um, that's, that's what I do. Uh, that's who I am. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's dig a little bit into Nate's story and let's start with the genesis of Nate. Like we always like to share childhood memories to kind of allow younger people who watch this podcast to be inspired by uh, these role models, because truly that's what they need um, so that they can kind of see, well, if this person who, you know, has a similar background as me, can do this well maybe i can do that too so what were you like as a kid um there's two points to make here um i was kind of a hellion uh kind of a rascalian a little bit aggressive uh from a young age um i like to put my hands on anything and everything i really could um, i was definitely the kid that was in the mud um, in the muck and kind of playing in the sand, throwing sand at kids, um, had a little bit of a behavior problem when I was a child, um, definitely grew out of it, uh, realized uh, once I had the sand kind of flung back in my face, that's probably not the best thing to do. Um, and I very quickly realized that if I, if I wanted friends and wanted to succeed in life that I needed to have other people like me. Um, so that was a big motivation as, uh, in my early childhood to kind of figure out what, what I wanted to do, uh, who I wanted to be. Um, from an early age, uh, I was also a kid who liked to take things apart. Um, I was the kid that you would hand a remote to, and instead of changing the batteries, he took a Phillips screwdriver to it, um, and took it completely apart and wasn't able to get it back together. Um, uh, definitely a Lego kid, uh, definitely, uh, very curious about how things worked. Uh, wanted to touch the thing, wanted to push the buttons. If there was a big red button, I was the kid to push it, um, hundred percent. Um, my early childhood um, uh, was in the United States, so I was born in Kansas. Uh, my extended family lives in Nebraska. Um, and the first couple years, meaning the first two years, I was uh, in the United States. And then very quickly, uh, my dad joined the military uh, to kind of get us um, uh, out of poverty. I had a very uh, poor uh, upbringing. <laughs> Um, but to get us out of poverty, kind of joined the military and we went over overseas. So I spent uh, my early uh, formative years in school in uh, primary school is what they call it over in the UK. I wore things called plimsolls and went out and hung out on the yard, had a little uniform, the whole nine. Um, learned, learned what a lorry was, what rubbish is, that type of deal. Uh, <laughs> subsequently transitioned uh, after, after we PCS from uh, Milden Hall, we went over to uh, Spangdalem and Bitburg in Germany, which is a another Air Force base, um, but in Germany. So I've got pictures of myself in the Eagle's Nest and in the bunkers and all the other type of cool stuff from being in Germany. Uh, it was very, uh, these are memories that I probably haven't dug up in a really long time. So probably missing a couple of details there, but um, childhood was very wondrous. Um, 
didn't realize how kind of a rocky childhood that I had had until um, later in life. Um, it didn't really have roots uh, because we jumped around and moved so often. Mm -hmm. uh, we did eventually come back to the U.S., uh, spent some time in um, Maryland, so the D.C. area. Um, that's where I went to high school. Um, when we came back, that's where we um, came back to. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize that I had it a little bit rocky because, again, didn't have those roots, didn't have the community to rely on, didn't have those type of things. It was very much Nate and his computer early on in the onset of like what was going on. I always had to occupy my time because I didn't have a lot of people to communicate with. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's 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 the early journey, though, for sure. Yeah, definitely must have been hard because, you know, you have to make friends every time you move, but staying in touch with them not in the age of social media and having the tool set to stay in communication with each other yeah. hard. Even, even the language barrier, I, I guess from here to UK wasn't, I guess, too bad, but to Germany then, yeah, yeah I can definitely see that. So yeah, and I, I was fortunate. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That? Go ahead. No, I was, was, <laughs> no, was going to ask you uh, the next question. Yeah, no, but I was going to rip off of the, the language barrier. I was a little bit fortunate in the sense of uh, I was on an Air Force base, so I was able to communicate with the kids that were there. So once I once we kind of went outside the fence or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. So um, who played a role in your life in your journey from your childhood to adulthood? Uh, I would say my mom. I uh, really look up to my mom and my dad a whole lot. I'm a very family family oriented person. Um, so it's very much been a, uh, core unit of four. So my mom, my dad, my sister, that's really my immediate family. There aren't very many others kind of in there as of now I've got my wife, but, um, yeah, I'd say my mom and my dad, um, seeing them kind of struggle, um, and, um, my mom having a child in her stomach and then also going to college at the same time and watching my mom sit at the computer and work a job, have a baby in her stomach and go to school at the same time, uh, right. that kind of instilled the drive to, do something with myself, right? If my mom can do it with those type of things going on, or my dad's willing to go get deployed somewhere, um, those have really been my role models and the ones that I stuck to the most and the most often. Um, otherwise, my icons and idols uh, come from horror movies. <laughs> um, I, I remember going to the video store as a child and picking those things up and the things I wasn't able to have and uh, all those type of things. Um, yeah, that a lot of that is kind of where my my idols were and who I wanted to be. Um, it's a lot of what I looked up to. So, what did you aspire to be as a kid? When you said, uh, "When I grow up, oh, I'm man. gonna be," um, but yeah, uh, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Um, I wanted to work. Uh, on a boat. <laughs> it's not what happened. It is not what happened, but I wanted to be a marine biologist. Um, I really wanted to work at a zoo uh, is really what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Um, distinctly remember going to the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. It's uh, one of the better ones in the United States. Um, they've got an aquarium that's got a tunnel and you can walk through this tunnel and the sharks and the manatees and all the other type of stuff. I it just, I remember being in wonder um, I remember going back home and like putting flippers on my feet and going to the pool and being, being the kid that was just in, into water animals. Um, at some point, um, I did decide not to do that, um, but that was actually later to life that stuck through all the way through up until um, probably about midway through high school. Uh, that's what I, I wanted to do. I wanted to be the biology student, wanted to do those things. Um, but yeah, I, I realized that I would have to get a PhD. <laughs> Uh, to be able to do that job. Um, so that's that's why that eventually ended up rolling off. Uh, I didn't want to do that much schooling. So. so we've also had a couple other guests on the podcast who are also veterans. Would mm -hmm. you mind telling us about, I guess, that chapter of your yeah. life and how that kind of paved your way to who you are today also? Yeah, 100%. Um, so I had two options when I graduated high school. Um, and leading up to graduating high school, I had realized that I wanted to do computers. Um, I was very fortunate to have a teacher. Um, her name is Miss Stahl. She probably hasn't heard of me or thought of me in a million years, but uh, definitely influential in kind of pushing me in a specific direction. I had a computer science class that uh, I learned how to write Java. Um, if you've ever written Java, please don't. Um, I will, that is the hill I will die on, um, absolutely. 
um, please fight with me in the comments. <laughs> um, but one of those things, uh, she pushed me towards computers. Um, I was the kid who would write the one-liner, be done with the assignment. Um, it's a very common kind of tale or scenario or story when you talk to people who are do the stuff now. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of time on my hands in that class and she kind of pushed me towards the computers and I realized that that was something that I, would, I was actually good at and because I spent so much time on them, taking things apart, I kind of understood a little bit more than the other kids. But as I transitioned from high school to real life, I needed to decide on whether or not I wanted to go to college. Um, and I've never been I've never been the kid who can sit in a chair and listen to a professor give a speech or a lecture on something and then actually translate it into something that I will be able to hold on to and then use in the future. Um, also, I had I had had a couple of horror stories where, hey, someone's sitting in class, you can get a degree, but you don't get a job. Um, that is something that really concerned me, right? Um, absolutely concerned me. And in order to do that, my dad had really been pushing me to get some structure, uh, get some time, uh, get some something underneath my belt in order to be able to prove that I could do something to someone, right? So that's why I made that decision, uh, along with the fact that they pay for school. So what I did is, is I, I, I went to the Air Force uh, because I was told Air Force Best Force. Um, and in the process of doing that, I, I got some schooling. So they go through like a technical college. You got basic training, all that other type of stuff. I definitely got yelled at. Definitely looked a little bit different than I do today. Wouldn't have had the scruff. Uh, would have had a high and tight. Uh, would have been wearing a uniform. Um, but it was very instrumental in giving me the ability and the opportunities to be able to get hands-on experience. So uh, the first time I imaged a server, the first time I reset Active Directory credentials, the first time I I configured an access control list. Um, the first time I ever learned what cryptographic material is and how to plug a, uh, a port into a plane and then upload keys and all of that very instrumental um, stuff that I thought was really lame while I was doing it. <laughs> That's the other thing to say. I uh, was not very excited about doing it while I was doing it because I didn't see a point. Um, ended up being very instrumental in uh, the rest of the stuff that I ended up doing and the experience that I was then able to apply to the public sector. Um, definitely look highly upon the Air Force or any sort of military member. Um, if I were to go back in time, I'm not sure that that's the path that I would have taken. Um, it's not for everyone. And then you moved into security operations or was there something in between? Yeah, so um, in the process of joining the military, I had, uh, there was a gap in time. So my first job was actually an internship. Uh, I worked for the Census Bureau um, in Clinton, Maryland. <laughs> at the Land Technology Support Office. Uh, I really remember my boss here, that's why I'm giggling. This is a very funny individual, um, but doing Active Directory resets. Uh, when, you say, when you say Land Technology Support Office, think uh, the room with all the cages, right? With all the computers yeah. and all the asset stuff. Um, I was one of those guys that was sitting in, sitting in the cages doing Active Directory resets, um, group policy pushes, those type of things. Um, that was my first job. And then rolling into security operations, my first actually true security operations role would have been with the Naval Sea System Command. Um, so if you know the Navy Yard um, down in DC, that is where it was. Um, and I went ahead and did um, platform IT systems. So I think uh, weapon systems, boats, um, anything that is not connected to uh, like a server rack or something like that, uh, but a platform in particular. I did the auditing and compliance piece of that, and I did the uh, the testing of those assets. So if they had a new piece of technology that passed across the desk, uh, I was the guy who did the auditing. So, hey, this, this plug, this port, uh, this is what's exposed. This is how someone might attack it. This is how it works. Uh, here's, a, here's a green check mark. Uh, I did everything I was supposed to do. Similar to QA, but a little bit more nuanced and, and technical. Um, but that was my foray into security, really, uh, because I'd say that first internship was not a security role. Um, but I do think it's really important for anyone, especially for the audience who may be listening to this, who's trying to break into security. It's really important that you get a skill set that is not security uh, related or um, directly tied to security before you roll into security. Um, I think it's a really important point to make is if you've got that background in computers, hey, I understand how Active Directory works. Um, I've answered a help desk phone call. Um, I may have re-imaged an asset, those type of things. Those basic fundamentals of, hey, this is how a computer works. This is how you interact with it. Is something that 
ends up being lacking in some of the candidates that I've had come across my desk recently. Um, and I think it's really valuable to have that uh, piece of knowledge before you kind of roll into it. Um, but yeah, that was my first kind of foray into being an analyst. Um, subsequently, and this is a while back, right? Uh, there were a slew of jobs, one of those being the uh, the one that I worked with Kathy at, at Agio. Um, but cybersecurity analyst, uh, incident response analyst, lead analyst, uh, kind of made my way through uh, the tier one, two, three type of situation. Um, and then once I made my way through the one, two, three tier situation, I kind of picked a certain facet or a specialization that I was most interested in um, being proactive security. That's what I do now. Um, or threat operations. It's got a whole bunch of different names. The, the definition of it is kind of nebulous. Um, but yeah, the, the journey was a, was a long and slow one. And it's not something that I, I realized when I first started that was going to snowball into uh, something so large or something so impactful. Uh, I deal with a lot of people all, all day, every day. And the people that I do interact with are uh, hurting or in a situation where they don't want to be in um, and those type of things. And um, that's a lot of the benefit I kind of get out of my, my work or my role is being able to actually help those people. Um, yeah. That's awesome. I know you kind of stated some things already, but what are some steps you would recommend to those who, to people who would, you know, want to be in a position where you are? Yeah, uh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, first and foremost, though, if, if you get anything out of what I say to you guys today, um, uh, genuine curiosity. Um, I call them the three C's, but the, the first one would be genuine curiosity. Uh, keep your curiosity, uh, keep your appetite for learning something new, keep your appetite for, hey, if I push this button, what will happen? Though that quality and that aspect of a person is the most valuable thing that you can have in IT, uh, security in particular, but IT in general, my opinion. And then I said the three C's, so um, uh, critical thinking is the second one, and then compassion. You can add those three things. Um, you're going to have a lot more or you will have a better time actually uh, getting someone to invest into you um, because it's it's very it's very present and well known that uh, a security career can pay very well. Right. Um, it can pay very well. It's a lucrative career. There are a lot of people who want to do it, um, but either don't have the chops or they don't know how to get in or X, Y, Z. Um, work on yourself first. Hit the three C's and then uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, what is it? I think it's fail, fail hard, fail fast, fail often. It's kind of the motto. Um, if you don't fail, you can't learn anything. You can't. If you don't make mistakes, you can't learn anything. Um, no one can be perfect 100% of the time. And if you aren't in an environment where you are able to actually fail at something, uh, you will never grow. Um, and it's important to do so on, on a daily basis, if possible. <laughs> make a mistake. Uh, press the button. Have it blow up. Uh, please don't do it in prod. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are those are those are the the high points um, as far as like actionable things you can do right now, um, things that you can learn that are valuable right now in the industry or things that I would be looking for in a candidate to hire those type of things. Um, generally, uh, the behavioral stuff we already talked about, but for as far as technical skill, um, get some sort of query language underneath your belt, um, something like uh, if you're interacting with the seam and you're going operations side, something like um, learn what the elk stack is. Uh, learn how to use Splunk query language, learn how to actually ask questions of your data so you can actually get a result and then answer someone else's question. Um, those are those are the things that you do as an analyst that are going to provide you, one, the most highlight, and then two, the most insight into the machines that you're looking at. Um, that is a really good starting point. Um, as far as other technical skill sets, um, some level of scripting, um, not asking you to be a dev, and not asking you to create a new program from net new, uh, don't need to change uh, everything in the world, but um, some sort of bubblegum and duct tape, really, that's what I would call it. Some sort of bubblegum and duct tape, being able to slap things together to get it to work, to be able to recognize how it's functioning, how it's working. Um, I think that skill set is uh, few and far between. Um, it doesn't need to be Python either. That's usually where everyone kind of sticks everyone. Uh, I love Python, uh, but I hate white space. Uh, so just pick whatever you like as far as scripting languages, because they all kind of work in the same shape and fashion, you accomplish the same goals, the same stuff. Um, yeah, the, that would, there's other stuff, but those would be my broad generalist, like generalized like recommendations for 
um, getting a role or getting started and getting a role in like security operations. Um, the other thing to say, and I, I think this is also readily apparent based off some of the other guests that you guys have had to kind of harken back to some other people is um, especially when you're breaking in networking, 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 talk to people. You got to actually put your face in front of someone. You actually have to shake the hand. Um, even if it makes you uncomfortable or you put, put yourself in a situation, you can use it as that fail hard, fail fast uh, piece of it. You can fail in doing that. That's totally fine. But the more people you shake a hand with, the more people you give your story to, the more people you say, hello, hey, what are you doing? And actually expressing interest in that. That is what gets you in the door. Um, because again, there are potentially 1,500, 1500 other people who are vying for the same position, the same role. Um, why would someone pick you over someone else and differentiating yourself in, in the sense of, okay, hey, I've got a, enough soft skills to hold a conversation with someone. It's really, really, really valuable as well. So. It's funny. I was just telling Antonio that I'm like, you got to go to those networking events. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say, uh, Kathy, how long have we known each other? Like four or five years now. Yes. And the one thing Kathy has always just glued into my brain is networking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cybersecurity is not only a technical problem, it's a people problem. Um, I can mm -hmm. I can shout to the hills that you've got 15, 20, 12 R2 servers out here that have been patched in 10 years. Um, but if you don't do anything about it, what was the point of it, right? So it's definitely a people problem on, on multiple different aspects. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but it's what you do or security operations an instant response is not for everybody, right? It, it's, I would say it's not for the faint of heart because it can be very demanding. Um, it may have, uh, you know, it may put a burden on your personal life uh, in terms of the time that you have to be available. Like, wh what is your take on this? Yeah, uh, there are a couple of things there, right? Um, Everyone wants to be a firefighter and wants to be the one to put out the fire uh, until you end up right next to the fire. <laughs> is what I'd say. Uh, it, it's, 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 it, that's probably the best way to say it. Um, it. It's really cool to do the cool things. In all actuality, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a mm -hmm. lot of work to actually eradicate, contain, recover, do lessons learned, preparation, it, like all those things, the pickerel process, doing those from cradle to grave is simple to talk about. And execution is incredibly difficult. Um, and I would definitely say it's not for the faint of heart, um, but I do think that it is for everyone. Um, Ooh, faint of cool. heart, yes, but I do think it is for everyone in the sense of um, you can be very literate in like security operations. You can understand, hey, this is the pipeline of how an incident is supposed to work. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is how I would do it. Um, but basic literacy meaning like basic computer literacy and understanding of computers or even just literacy in general, being able to read and do those things. Um, I, I think that is just as valuable. And an example of this would be, um, let's say a communications major wants to be in security, applies for a job or a role, right? That communications major may have a better sense of how an incident is supposed to work. Let's say someone's getting fished right? They may have a preamp or they may be preemptively uh, more suspicious of things because they know how people communicate. It just mm -hmm. depends on how you are slotted in and how that specific niche or the thing that you have specialized in kind of fits into the particular incident you're talking about. So I don't think it should be exclusionary in the sense of, hey, if you're not ready for the fire, get out of the kitchen type of situation, but it should definitely be, uh, it, it should definitely be available to everyone. Is, is what I would say. I, I don't think that there is a skill set um, or having like a, a diversity in skill set, whether it's color, creed, religion, X, Y, Z. I think that provides more of a value to a team versus having uh, for the same person, right? Because they have different experiences and uh, different worldviews and looking at an incident in a different perspective or a different set of eyeballs has saved me a lot of the time. Um, and a lot of the time when we end up in those instant response calls or any of that other type of thing, um, I'm calling on the sysadmin that doesn't know anything about security that has been working on this machine for the last four years. Well, he's going to know more, even though he's not a security guy. Um, he's going to have the answers to the questions. So um, definitely not for the faint of heart as far as time. Uh, I've definitely sacrificed 
uh, Christmas. I've definitely sacrificed Thanksgiving. I've sacrificed uh, quite a bit of time in my own personal life to be able to do those things. Um, and if you've got a good employer, they return that time back to you and then invest in you um, because you're giving that time. Right. And it, that's kind of the trick, right, is, is, is finding your fit and function and your place in the world of security and having someone who will invest that time back into you and, and that type of thing. So, um, yes, it can definitely be rough, um, can definitely be hot and heavy, uh, but it goes through spikes and spikes and dips, just like everything else does in the world. Yeah, I, I love how you stress the importance of, of leveraging your your unique perspectives and background to help solve a problem yeah. or put yourself in the shoes of the bad guys and gals. So that's really good. Yeah, hundred percent. It's, think, it's funny you also... say that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go for it, man. <laughs> I was going to say it's funny you say that too because so is that my. I was at my girlfriend's house yesterday. I was eating dinner. It was me, her, and her mom. And her mom just started a new job a few weeks ago. And my girlfriend mm -hmm. like really looks up to her mom. So she was like, and don't get me wrong, she's a very smart woman. And yeah. my girlfriend goes, Are you the smartest one who works there? And she goes, and her mom replies, It's not really about being like the smartest one who works there. It's just like I'm I may be smarter in this specific area, but then this person is smarter in this specific yep. area. And we kind of all, you know, connect the dots and, and work together the best we can. Yeah, I think that aspect is really, really applicable in security because I, inch deep, mile wide, or uh, mile deep, inch wide, whichever one you end up picking, whether you're a generalist or you're a specialist, um, you've got your own little camp or your own particular thing that you are concerned about. And being able to then, it's like, a, if you've ever seen Transformers, it's like building the big one, right? Combining all the legs and the pieces together to be able to actually accomplish something together. Um, security is a team sport, can't do it on your own. I can't yeah. learn all of it. Um, I know enough at this point in my career that I I know enough to know that I don't know anything is what I would say. <laughs> um, I've, I've kind of peered into the abyss and it's stared back at me is in the sense of like information is concerned and it's impossible to fill your brain with mm -hmm. everything. So you have to be able to rely on the people surrounding you. Um, I think your girlfriend's girlfriend's mom is 100 percent correct <laughs> yeah no, yeah, yeah. That, that's 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 the money right there for sure so when when i was at agio the match security service kept changing it was always changing mm -hmm. um it, yeah. it changed in acronyms but also obviously the approach because the technology landscape was changing and also the workforce was changing um you know yeah. at some point everybody was remote but you know, obviously, with the adoption of more mobility solutions, the adoption of cloud, the managed detection and response, or managed security services, whatever acronym of the day it was, it had to keep evolving and adapting to that change in yeah. in the technology and then also the threat landscape. Where is it going? Um, and a little bit of insight um, for the rest of them. Um, so managed security services, right? So. Um, and this is the way it was structured while I was working in there, um, is, okay, you're, you are a SOC analyst um, and you've got multiple different clients, right? So you do things like detection creation, um, alarm review, just like a regular SOC analyst would do. You look at the alerts, determine whether or not they're malicious, uh, categorize them by severity, those type of things. Um, but there was also, uh, there's also a little bit of a consulting piece to that, right? Um, you've got mm -hmm. a client um, and they have requests or needs that are not always going to fit the mold, what is pre prescribed by either a contract or those type of things. And security is not going to be a one size fit all kind of issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important as far as a services industry for cybersecurity that the medium and small size businesses will probably and likely continue to rely on managed services and managed service providers. I think there is a critical mass in which uh, like an internal security team is then able to uh, subsequently support an organization. Um, the number or the monetary value tied to when that cutoff is, is not something I'm going to be aware of and it's going to be independent of each company. Um, but what I see in the future is uh, more augmentation, right? So either more services being provided or um, uh, packages, right? So, hey, I only want you to do brand and risk monitoring. I only want you to do this certain aspect of mm. uh, security for us because we may not be able to either backfill the person 
or we may not have that um, talent in house, all those other type of things. I think it's also really beneficial to kind of say this out loud as well, is that I've worked in the DOD, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked in finance, I've worked in insurance. Um, I've kind of run the gambit as far as industries and then all of those kind of balloon as far as small to large, um, where I found my best um, working, and this is me, and this could be personal preference, would be in, those, in the bigger company. Um, and the reason being is, is they've got one, they've got the budget and they've actually got the security resources to actually apply to things. So uh, the small and medium sized business does traditionally get left behind in the security sphere. And that's one of the biggest pain points as far as security incidents and likely will continue to be uh, yeah. one of the bigger pain points is that they just don't have the staff or they don't have the budget or they don't have the monetary means to do that. And that is where those MSSPs or those managed service providers would come into play. I think that's that's my prediction for the future. It's not very uh, crazy, um, but I think I think that's what will happen. And what about the actual testing of the detection and response capabilities? Mm -hmm. I've seen an evolution there, going from blue team testing, red team testing, purple team. Like how? Yeah demystify that one for us. <laughs> yeah, so and uh, I can give you a little bit of an example of, of, of where I currently work, right? I um, mean, how it's set up. Um, can't give team yeah. sizes, but I can give you a little bit of an example. So it's split up into three different groups, right? So uh, there's the threat hunt group. So that's proactive security. It's all scientific method driven. So stuff like, hey, I'm going to create a hypothesis. I'm going to collect my data sources that are uh, referencing my hypothesis. I'm going to create a query and then I'm going to have an output, right? Output could be a million different things. There is a threat intelligence function. So um, context is king is what my uh, Intel guy likes to, likes to say to me. Um, his name is Eldon, uh, shout out to Eldon. Um, but without Intel, Hunt can't do what they need to do. I mean, it's not follow the news cycle. It's definitely the synthesis of um, information that's out there into a distilled product. Um, usually it's a TTP, so a behavior or a tactic technique and procedure. Um, some sort of command line parameters or flags, those type of things, and getting those all distilled into a nice, neat package and then being supplied to the hunt team can be beneficial. And then as far as the uh, testing of the detections, right, uh, we also have a uh, purple team, right? So we've got our testers, and it is an ad hoc function of the testers to then do, um, like, detection engineering. So you, you'll use adversary simulation platforms, stuff like Caldera, stuff like atomic red team um, and all those type of things and um, all three of those parts of this will be manipulated and work together and i think that's what's most important about this is they're not all in their own vertical or in their own little pocket of the pocket of the team we all work together even though we were split by, by function and the trick there is intel will inform the pen testers that XYZ actors conducting this type of attack over this specified amount of time, they'll go ahead and run that type of attack from the outside, test said thing, uh, poke, prod, or spurt vulnerability or something like that. And then in particular, this is where the blue team kind of comes into play is there'll be an agent on that machine, whether it's a EDR or an antivirus, or we've got logging on that machine with Splunk, it's going to be dumped into Splunk, but then you're able to actually see the artifacts. Uh, that get dumped from said testing. And that is what creates the value or the examples of what you would be going to go look for uh, for detection. Um, it's not one size fits all, right? Um, detection engineering has its own pipeline and its own steps that kind of go in there. And I'm very much dumbing that down. Um, but it's the back and forth between those two or those three different groups that causes the testing uh, to get to occur and to validate in particular. And the most important part of everything you just said is the collaboration, right? Being able to collaborate. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm also a hacker, but I would never, never, ever, ever do some of the stuff that those guys are doing. Right? I can break stuff, um, but I'm much better at fixing it. So it's better to rely on them. And there, there's an aspect from the blue side and the red side, and it. it's not adversarial in the sense of the red team does something and they test and now I'm able to detect it so they can't use it in the future. It's 
they get better and we get better at the same time. And it's that collaborative, exactly what you said, it's that collaborative effort between the two where we raise the bar high enough to where an, an attacker or an actor would then subsequently pass on us as a target, right? It's just too difficult. I've got this guy who's got an open S3 bucket. Why would I attack the, why would I attack Fort Knox? Yeah. Antonio, did you learn any of the stuff that Nate is talking about here in school or is Mm, not, like i mean like i guess doing some assignments i guess like some things would come up and not really i guess like honed in on, mm -hmm. on specifically. yeah so how how would you learn those skills then yeah i can tell you how i did it uh whether or not my path fits for you is a whole other thing because i didn't take a very traditional path uh i think i said it uh prior in, in us talking here but um, i'm not a very big school person I'm just not. It's just not my forte. I can I'm sit there and read either. a book all day. Yeah, exactly. I can sit there and read a book all day and I can regurgitate it to you. I can absolutely do that. But all that does for me is that I memorize something and then I, I'm never going to use it. So for me and how to develop those skill sets and how I went about developing them, um, it really was a home lab, right? Um, if I could switch this camera around, you guys would absolutely, your, your jaws would drop. I've got it. <laughs> I've got like four different computers in front of me. I've got, a, I've got like four different monitors. It looks crazy in here because I am, it's a home lab and I've got stuff that I break and that I've set up and, um, but setting up a home lab, it would be my recommendation. Uh, set up a domain controller, set up a Windows endpoint, set up a, maybe an exchange server or a 2019 uh, Windows server and put Splunk on there, put, bro on there put security onion on there uh look at what a pcap looks like inside your network understand that um if i write this piece of regex it will parse out these piece of logs the actual hands-on keyboard aspect of it and setting up a lab um there are a lot of very 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 good examples of labs and um intros to labs but that piece of the pie is what gave me not only the confidence to go to an employer and tell someone that i could do something uh, but it also gave me the confidence of, okay, um, I know how, exactly how this piece of malware works because I've double clicked the executable and watched the computer melt before uh, it, without that real time experience and that, that interaction with those type of things. Uh, it's very difficult to get the required experience to be able to actually recognize what bad looks like. If you don't know what good looks like, how are you supposed to know what bad looks like? You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. Uh, that would be my recommendation. That's how I went about developing my skill set is setting up those labs. Um, it did get out of hand uh, very, very, very quickly. <laughs> but it's not as easy as just saying set up a lab. This is not how it works. You're going to need to learn what a subnet is. You're going to need to learn how to how to do port forwarding. You need to learn what NAT is. You got There's a lot of basics that are involved. Mm -hmm. But in the process of setting those things up, you learn all those basics. Uh, you get those underneath your belt. And then you're able to then subsequently build on them. Um, and it always, it always, it always tickles me pink and it's, it still drives me today is when you double click something and it explodes, it feels cool. So, um, that's, that's another benefit to doing that is watching something melt. It's pretty, pretty neat. <laughs> and it, it's, uh, I'm kind of the same way, I guess, like I, okay. So before I guess the COVID lockdown, I was going to like in-person classes and all that. Mm -hmm. And I guess just like sitting in class, yeah, it goes by and then you kind of remember for a little and then it goes away. But then when yeah. the lockdown happened and I was kind of forced to like figure it all out on my own, it definitely helped, I guess, retain the information like that. So I could I could definitely relate with you there. Yeah, you could only someone way more intelligent than me. It was a book I read, but you can only hold something like seven things in your brain at one time. Right. And that's if you're really, really, really good. I could probably only hold two. Yeah, two brain cells just fighting each other probably but my point here is you can only hold a certain amount of information in your brain at one time and if you don't utilize those things you don't you don't ingrain like the pathways in your memory to be able to go back to them and utilize them again and all of my skill set is very much tied to hey i watched this really cool thing it destroyed all this stuff so i remember it and that has been really beneficial but yeah lab um there's a there's definitely a book that I've got on my shelf. If I if I remember, I'll pull it out. The lab stuff, that that right there, it also shows drive when, say, I'm interviewing someone or something like that. It shows a lot of drive and a lot of 
uh, gusto to actually learn the thing, that genuine curiosity that we were talking about, that shows that aspect of it. So. And even what you just said, like making the connection, like, you know, you do something once and everything melts down, you know, the second time when it comes up, like, oh, crap, I already melted everything. So I'm not going to do this. Again. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and it's also a safe environment where you can reset those things, right? Like after it's broken, you can fix it and go back and figure out what you did wrong or, hey, this protection or this block that I put in place didn't work and all those other type of things. Yeah, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, fail fast, <laughs> because yes, from yes. mistakes, you will learn for sure. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I remember you talked about honeypots too. You like to play with those. Yeah. Uh, so th they're, they're gone now. Um, I haven't had them. It was the 12, 11 right now. Um, yeah, I got rid of them about a year and a half ago. Um, I used to have a fleet of honeypots. So like I said, it, this did get out of hand. <laughs> My lab definitely got out of hand at some point. Um, I used to have a fleet of honeypots out there. I think about six different assets out on AWS. Um, but again, it, it was all in the pursuit of having something real uh, to look at. Um, mm -hmm. I had spent a lot of time in the SOC. I clicked alerts. I would closed things. I created case notes. And then I go in the next day and it's the same alerts and it's the same case notes and it's, it's the same stuff. And I was looking for something new. Um, I, I want to see what's actually going out on the internet. Um, I want to see the people who are getting owned. Um, some, uh, there is a company that is doing this now. They're called Gray Noise. Um, if you ever get a chance, go ahead and look at those people. They're doing some wonderful work in the honeypot space or deception space. Um, but in particular, I had all these honeypots out there and I, I new vulnerability would come out. I, Apache struts XYZ, right? And I would set up a vulnerable server and I'd put it out there on, on the public web and I would, I would have logging enabled I would have it go into a third party stuff. So in case they blew it up, I could see it. And I would go through those attacks maybe like about once a month. This is passion project, right? So it's not work. So I'm doing this on my own time to see what, what's going out there on the world. But hey, go look at all the file paths that they're hitting. What IP addresses are they coming from? What countries? What ASNs are they coming from? Are they doing anything that's out of the normal that I haven't seen before? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're using Cobalt Strike with a different profile or all those type of things. But collecting all of that also gave me a different type of experience than I would have gotten inside of a, let's say, a particular client or a network that I had actually worked on by myself because they're, it's vulnerable by design. And having something that's vulnerable by design is going to draw a certain crowd of people towards it versus, versus what I was working on in my day job. Um, yeah, definitely had to take this down. Uh, I left one of my AWS honeypots up. And got a got a twelve hundred dollar bill at the end of the month because I didn't realize what I was doing, so I, I had to cut that out. Yeah, <laughs> but it is a tool within the the security operations uh, functionality, right, for an organization or or, or not? Yeah, uh, deception, uh, deception, deception technologies in general, right? So it's not just honeypots. Um, there are other things. Uh, there's a free tool out there. Um, I think it's Think is Canary. Um, yep. They've got, uh, they're called Canary Tokens. Um, basically, what they will do is they will alert you of IP address, geolocation, all those type of things. And what's really important about a honeypot um, or a Canary Token or Honey Token, whatever you want to call it, versus like a traditional security detection mechanism is it's got a higher fidelity. So if mm -hmm. someone is touching that, it should be in a location or a position inside your network or on external network where if someone's touching that there's something wrong. Um, so it's got a much higher fidelity versus like, hey, someone used PowerShell with base64 encoding. That doesn't always, could be real, could not be real. Um, yeah, so it, it's got a facility or uh, it's got a an ability to give you more fidelity from your alerts, but the direction you use to deploy a honeypot or a canary token is really important before you do it. So you can create a lot of false positives, so. For sure. But it can be an early detection warning system too, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So think like Canary and Coal Mine. I think that's where the name, I'm not yeah, really exactly. sure that's where the name came Very from. Smart but name. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. What about AI? We haven't talked about AI. We got to talk about AI a little bit. Yeah. Um, AI. Um, so I'm not the biggest proponent of AI. Um, I'm actually on the other side of the fence. Um, I, I really just don't like it. I'm not a big fan. I think that humans are better at catching humans than computers are at catching yeah. humans. 
I think that will always be the case. I think the brain is the best detection engine. But as far as AI is concerned, um, I think it's got its own. Um, it, de it depends on what aspect you're asking me about. Um, broadly and generally, I don't think it's a silver bullet. Um, I don't think that a company or a team should rely on AI to do everything for them. I think that uh, is not a good idea. I've seen it fail. I've, I've worked in situations where I've had tools that were just AI based that they bubble stuff up and they can have value, but it's really, 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 really dependent on the data set, data set that the AI is trained on. Um, if you don't have the data set to be able to use those, they end up being kind of hit or miss, depending. Um, if you're a very large company, if you're a Walmart, you're a Google, you're a XYZ, name the company that's massive, and you've got that type of data, I think it can provide immense value. Mm -hmm. um, I think it can also provide value in small, small, medium-sized businesses as well, but the type of value is going to be different, right? You're not going to train it on this very large data set. You're going to use it for, hey, chat GPT, please write me XYZ uh, as a template, and then you're going to riff off of it. Um, I think that uh, if it, for efficiency's sake, or at least in my, in my case, um, it's being used for efficiency sake versus yes. uh, the raw mental tasks that, that I would be doing. Um, do I think that AI will get to that point? Absolutely, 100, 150%. Uh, but I think that there's going to have to be someone at the pilot of that. Um, mm -hmm. And that will likely be someone like myself or like you guys uh, yeah. that, would, that would then subsequently pilot those things. Um, okay. And I think doing that responsibly and ethically is incredibly difficult to do. So it's usually a subject that uh, I stay at arm's length. Until it gets there, I'll probably keep it at arm's length. Yeah, I agree with you, I think there's you need the human oversight but you also need the the ethical oversight the, the moral compass mm -hmm. needs to be held by a human <laughs> and not by something that was yeah, yeah. created by god knows whom <laughs> yeah and, and, and hope and hopefully a human who's got good good morals and ethics themselves yes, <laughs> right for sure yeah. and maybe that's a committee kind of a thing and not just one person wearing all that responsibility right Kathy has a question here that caught my attention. How are yep. the bad guys using AI? Oh, uh, just like we are <laughs> for those templates. Uh, I think automated payload generation. So stuff mm -hmm. like uh, doing fuzzing. So I want to launch a million different attacks or variations of traffic at a specific endpoint or a web application. Um, you can do that a lot faster, right? Um, it can iterate through a lot of different payloads that may be more applicable than I would be able to do manually. We've also got scripts and utilities that will do that on their own, but those have a predefined set list of uh, variations they would use, right? AI can generate and evaluate those things a lot faster than the human could. So you'll get a lot of uh, denial of service type things, um, automated, mm -hmm. automated payload generation. Um, think uh, like phishing an email, in, in particular phishing an email uh, the bad guys will be using AI in particular because what they can do is they can train themselves on social media data, um, get the insights into your life that would trick you the most, right? And then they can send that pre-canned email. Um, it's very much the advancement or the iteration of a tool. Have you, if you've ever heard of, uh, there's a tool out there called the Social Engineering Toolkit. Uh, I think David Kennedy put it out there. This is very much the advancement of that of that frame mm -hmm. of reference and getting a pre-canned email that fits everyone type of situation. I think AI kind of benefits them in that aspect. Um, otherwise, um, I haven't really seen, I haven't really seen, I, I'm saying this now and I'm hesitant to even say this because I probably will now see it, um, but I haven't seen anything AI specific as far as exploitation or attack just yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's stuff, the scale. So. Yeah, it's the scale that to me is, is the scary part. Um, because of the automation that they can leverage. Um, but also I, what I see a lot is that whenever there's a new hire, an intern, they're the first to get hit by these phishing, smishing, <laughs> whatever kind of attacks. Is, is there yeah. some level of scripts or machine learning or AI behind the scenes? Like, how does that work? I would assume that that comes from OSINT. Uh, I wouldn't assume that that has any relevance to AI. Um, it depends, right? I, there could be a scenario or an instance of this, uh, but what I think is likely happening there, or at least this based off my what I've seen in the past. So 
it'd be open source intelligence, right? So someone's got all their stuff publicly advertised on social media. Uh, yeah. Writing a dossier on someone uh, using open source intelligence is very, very easy to do. Uh, a lot of people yeah. don't realize that. But a lot of that is just pretexting on uh, who you're targeting, get, gaining information, who are they, where, where did they go to school, what's their maiden, what's their mom's maiden name, what's the, what's the make and model of their first vehicle. Those things get published on the internet all the time, but, but I think that's likely the sin, scenario or the instance where that would occur. Um, yeah, at least that's where I've seen it. Okay. Yeah, I'm always mystified as to, as soon as they say that, like you said, as soon as they say it on LinkedIn or something, I'm mm -hmm. I'm new here. Boom, <laughs> they get immediately <laughs> yeah. tagged. Likely with the bad, likely with the badge picture, with the, yeah. with the photo and the bark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we 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 can go down the the LinkedIn and the social media rabbit hole, but I'm a bit scared to do so. <laughs> it's, okay. um, it's all good. It's all good. Any, any words of caution? I will leave it at that. Around social media. Words of caution around social media. Yeah, really check out your privacy settings. I know that's like a given and an obvious, but uh, I will tell you that when when I target people, that's where I go. So you're gonna go to a LinkedIn, you're gonna go to a Twitter, a Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Like all of the social media sites, you're gonna collect that information. There are automated tools and utilities and scripts that will pull that information and public records off of you. Um, you can't protect from everything is the first thing. So paranoia and skepticism, uh, I think are of value when we're talking about this subject, but to go full tinfoil hat is a mistake. Uh, you don't want to ruin your life because you're paranoid about what's online. Um, but yeah, it, don't post personally identifiable information. Don't post your birthday. Don't, don't when, when you're having a birthday, wait until a couple of days after to post the picture of where you're at. I mean, especially if you're a C-suite, an executive, someone who's got a whole bunch of cash in their pocket. and. I know this sounds silly to go go that direction on it because we're talking to maybe potentially students or someone who's trying to break into the industry, but understanding your risk profile and the threat model that would be targeting you, even as a student, is of value to put yourself in the mindset of an attacker, right? If you could put yourself in the mindset of someone who would be trying to get to you, why would they be trying to get to you? How would they be trying to get to you? And understanding those things can better posture you for not only the social media aspect, but for... Uh, the detection engineering and the security side of the house is if you know how they're going to do it and why they're going to do it and how they're going to do it, well, then why aren't, why aren't we blocking it? Why aren't we taking care of it? Yeah. Very important question. Why? Because many people think, well, I'm not important. I'm just a kid or whatever it may be, but they may be somebody's parent or, or child and, you know, IE backdoor to, to the parents who may be having some type of- Yeah, department. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the Wild West Hacking Fest? I saw something in that you shared about that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That was a recent conference that me and uh, two of my uh, coworkers attended. So Wild West Hacking Fest is a uh, hacking festival or conference, if you want to call it a conference, it's very much not a conference. It's it's a little bit more niche and a little bit smaller than like a DEF CON or a Black Hat or one of those larger events. Uh, it's a little bit more down to earth. It, um, it's in South Dakota. So that's the first thing to say. It's in the middle of uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. So it's a very small town. Uh, there's not a lot going on there. So when uh, the hackers come to town, we kind of descend on the entire city. And you you walk into a bar or a shop, a gas station, and you've got six hackers in there. Um, that's not really something I get to experience uh, in West Virginia. That's the other thing to kind of highlight is uh, there are very few people that do what I do where I live. So being able to hang out with the nerds, my people, being able to talk shop uh, anywhere and anywhere is something that's incredible to me. Um, lock picking villages, uh, you've got talks, you've got uh, exercises, you've got escape rooms, you've got riding mechanical bulls, you've got all the cool stuff. Um, I think Deadwood in particular is really valuable because of the type of people who show up to them. Uh, versus like a DEF CON. Um, it's not all about who's got the most leap 
elite hacker skills or can break the mainframe or do all the cool stuff. And um, they're very much a sharing community, right? Um, it's very much oriented in the community, giving back to people, showing people that, hey, there are a couple of other routes that you can take to actually accomplish the goals that you're trying to do. Um, really big fan of John Strand, uh, Lizzie Carhart, all those very large names that may be on Twitter that you guys have likely seen before. Um, they all show up to that thing though. Um, and it's really, really interesting to see that they are just normal people. <laughs> you can just walk up to these people, right? Um, they do really cool stuff and they've got a really cool job, but being able to actually go up to someone and shake their hand and realize, oh, you're just like me. You're doing the same stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, would definitely recommend. Um, it's a little bit cheaper than other conferences as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw you also posted a blog called Analysis Reading. And I, I like the... the the concept because you talk about the thinking process of an analyst and you give yeah. a lot of recommendations. What's kind of the, the main takeaway from that blog or yeah, main, it? main takeaway. Right. Uh, so at, at some point, I think about last year, about midway through last year, um, I had compiled a list of resources to think about thinking. That's what that list is. <laughs> There's a lot of technical stuff in there. It's not really technical as much as it's just written in like collegiate language. Um, so, your eyes make like you know, like glaze over as you're reading those things. But uh, the main takeaway from that, that is I can teach you that port 22 is SSH and there's a specific type of uh, passer spraying and or uh, brute force attempt. And this is exactly what it looks like. Right. Um, but your biases or your biases, mm -hmm. um, the way you look at things, uh, the perspective of looking at things, um, all of that other good stuff plays a larger part in the questions that you're initially asking anyways. So if you aren't thinking about how you're thinking about things, you're not thinking about how you use a hypothesis, uh, the scientific method, um, memory, and how you're holding things in your brain, a lot of the stuff that we've kind of talked about here, um, that's the other thing to say, um, stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I do not uh, claim any of the stuff that I, I may have said. I, I definitely heard these things elsewhere. And a lot of the references that are in that uh, analysis reading list are people who I've drawn inspiration from um, and understanding. Um, there's really big names in there. If I'm going to highlight anything as far as reading out of that list, uh, there's a book by Cliff Stoll. Um, uh, it's called Cuckoo's Egg. Uh, I would recommend that book 100% through and through and through. Um, it doesn't read like a technical article or anything like that. It's one of the first instances of um, honey pots or honey tokens and stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, it's really, really, really interesting. Um, he's not a security guy, never was a security guy. Um, he's, a, he's a little bit strange, but uh, I definitely recommend that book. Definitely one of the aisles, one of the heroes. And as far as like thinking about how intrusions work, how to diagnose them, again, it's one of those first instances. So it's broken down to like the bare necessities of how to explain something to someone. Uh, so I really recommend that one. I would second that. I read that book about a year or two ago and I really enjoyed it, even though it was written a long time ago. And so some of the technology was kind of before my time. Yeah. <laughs> but the way he Same. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He painted the story, it, it just became understandable even for me. <laughs> uh, so I highly Yeah, no. Uh, 100%. And that list did come about because there were, there were quite a few people who would ask me like how do i go about doing investigations um how do i structure my thought process how do i go about thinking about things because there were a couple of instances where i'd get something uh on my desk and then they would be stuck on it and i'd go well have you looked at it this way uh what about if you weren't uh, a white male in texas how would you think about this um and i, I think that's really really important you know um if you don't take a step back and think about how you've approached approach something, you'll never get to the point where you're able to actually get to the answer that you were looking for because you're not looking at it the right way. Um, and it kind of surprised a couple of people that I work with that I'm, I'm doing those things and I do those like thought exercises while I'm thinking about things because it's one thing to uh, get the gritty nitty details and say, this is what happened without all the other context, right? And context is king and pulling in all those different sources to be able to think about things is important. So my next question would be, what what keeps you going every day? You wake up and you wake up in the morning, and what keeps you going? 
Ooh. Um, I know what my default answer is, but I want to be honest with you guys. Uh, it's coffee. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's caffeine. If I could mainline it into my body, I absolutely would. Um, it's definitely <laughs> caffeine. Um, there are days where it's up. There are days where it's down. Uh, what keeps me into security are or a couple of different experiences or instances in my life where I've had people tell me that I'm not going to be able to do what I'm doing right now or that I wouldn't succeed in it. Or um, I've also had people, teachers, X, Y, Z, hey, you're not going to go anywhere with your life. Um, it's not only that, but uh, that genuine curiosity, um, caffeine, and really my family, very family, family oriented. Uh, wake up every morning because I've got a wife uh, next to me and she makes me happy and I smile. Um, it's one thing to protect everyone in the world and to be the shield for everyone. Um, it's another thing to be the shield and to protect your family. Um, and that's a really big reason why I do what I do. But really, first and foremost, though, um, I'm just a giant nerd and I like caffeine. It's really how this ended up happening. I like to take things apart. Uh, I like to know how they take. I like to know how they work. And that genuine curiosity that I've hit multiple times while I've been talking um, is really why um, I do it. But I do. Um, it's never been a pursuit of money or accolades or anything hung up on my wall to say that I've been really cool or done something really cool. It's always been about what's the next thing? How does it work? How can I apply that to what I'm already doing? Um, is someone ahead of me? I like to be ahead. I like to be number one sometimes. It's not always the case. Um, but yeah, that, that's what drives me as a person. Um, it does fluctuate and change, though. Um, I don't think that having a form fit and mold for why you do something every day, um, I, th I think it should be able to be changed because it changes over time. Like I said, I've been doing it for about a decade or a little bit more than a decade. Uh, my answer to this question would be completely different if you asked me four years ago. Um, it really just kind of depends on where you're at in your life, what your goals are, what you're trying to accomplish. Because as of right now, I'm um, not really shooting for anything more than what I have. I like what I have, but um, in doing stuff like your guys' podcast and uh, going and giving a talk at a conference or doing those things allows me to give back to my community, right? Um, I've taken a lot from my community as far as uh, intelligence, knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, the blog articles. Uh, I've been a consumer for so long that being able to kind of flip that into giving back to the people who've given to me um, is also another why. Yeah, I, I could really sense a very strong sense of purpose uh, from you, Nate, because you, you reached out to me and say, how can I help? Let me be on your podcast. How can I help? Antonio, yeah, yeah. I can be a mentor. Like you ju just pour yourself out there. You're being very humble right now, but truly you've you've just given yourself and your time in while you're being in high demand for what you do. Um, like you said, to pay it forward, to help the community, to help others. Yeah, I think it's really, really, really important to do so. Um not only for younger folks, but there are, there are older folks who are getting into the industry as well. It's, I've had a lot of good people. I've been very fortunate and lucky to have mentors in my life that either looked out for me or looked over me or gave me insight into things that I may not have thought about. Um, there are people in my life like you, Kathy, where I got married, right? <laughs> and there were very few people in the company who, one, recognized that that was happening two, went out of their way to send me something, three, said something in general. And it's the people that care and genuinely care over the course of my career that really influenced um, my direction and my directionality. And the, the success that I've had is not built off my back. It is a complete community and team that has kind of given that. And that's really not, it's not a humble brag. I, I don't think I'm the humble person either. Um, I, I think I'm awesome, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, there have been a lot of people who have kind of afforded me a lot of opportunities to do the things that I wanted to do. And uh, I've had enough space in my life to be able to do this thing. So there is a measure of luck involved in this game. Um, I, I definitely think so. Uh, but I've just been really fortunate to kind of give the roses back to the people who have been able to uh, give me some. So. so we get to wrap things up um, by you asking a question to one of us. Yeah, um, really, really. Yeah, I'm asking you both. This goes to you both. I'm sorry. <laughs> just how this is going to work. Um, 
how can people get involved in what you guys are doing? Um, really is my question. Um, is there anything that you guys are looking for to one, uh, push your mission a little bit further or, um, get something or someone on here that you may not have gotten a perspective from? Is there anything that the community can give back to you guys? Um, I think that that is really, really valuable. And um, it's something that I'm looking to do as well. Like I said, my community here, um, I'm in a rural rural place where there aren't a lot of opportunities to give back to people or to teach people or any of those type of things. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you guys need to move forward to advance? Antonio, I'll let you go first. Hmm. I wanted you to go first. <laughs> I'm gonna, I mean, <laughs> I'd say we do a pretty good job at, I guess, getting the videos out there. And I, I think, I think if there was a way for, but I'm trying to, let me see how to word this. So I guess, Kathy, would you agree that I guess our target audience would be people my age? specifically i guess getting it to them specifically would be huge <laughs> yes yes okay and and to broaden that so audience i i feel that we our society and our school system has been underestimating what can be taught to children at a certain age and I've been in front of children of all ages, but even in in um, elementary school, who are so smart. They are so tech, technology savvy. Cybersecurity is already something that they know of and and use in good ways or bad ways. Um, and I feel the teachers need to be empowered with some tools um, to include some of that you know, just the, the, the domain itself in the curriculum, one way or another. It can be fun, it can be games, it can be just introducing the right role models to young people. I think that was one of the main goals is to, to show the different faces, the different backgrounds, the different stories so that everybody can relate to someone that we introduce to them. Um, and really demystifying cybersecurity which is a massive domain into different little things that can be relatable to someone's unique skill sets and strengths. So making it more relatable and, um, you know, the educational space needs to play a bigger part in solving the talent gap. And this, this podcast was really meant to bring role models to the forefront, use this material as educational content, um, and, and give the resources through our website, whether it's for um, K through 12 high school or beyond, you know, to kind of give the resources to the teachers and, and the students um, and, and beyond, you know, for veterans too, very committed to helping them find their path in, in our society and really continue that that per, you know, pursuing the purpose of service um, to the greater good, I think is is key. But you know, like Antonio nailed it, getting our content out to the educators, to the young people, uh, so the educators are kind of introducing it to them, um, one way or another. Um, I would really like to work on that. So I try to speak at conferences more to kind of share. Um, the challenges that we're gathering on the on this podcast. Um, so season one was about how people got into it. Season two has been about how people are struggling to get into it. Season three will be from the top down leadership point of view, um, their perspective. I don't know what that looks like yet, um, but that's kind of the, the <laughs> yeah. vision um, to kind of show different angles to what I feel is the fundamental problem in in uh, in cybersecurity, and, and it's the people problem, uh, and we need to keep focusing on the people aspect, the the human quality of it. You know, the 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 importance of technology. Yes, keep learning, but it is the purpose 
that you need to put first. It's your why. It's always why we ask this question during this podcast is understand what your purpose is. What are you trying to accomplish? What impact do you want to make on the world? Who do you want to help? Um, when you answer that question for yourself, I think it can become much clearer that cybersecurity can be something that is part of your, your yeah. journey. Yeah, I think so. Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's very succinct. There's a lot to say, you know, uh, there's a lot to say about the topic and not only the topic, but I've seen many a person struggle and not only to break in, but even after they've broken in of just, where do I go now? <laughs> because it's not a, it's not a predefined set path. It's not how it works. Um, and it's very nebulous and not only that but uh, from person to person you're going to get a different opinion on how they did it and how they think it works versus everyone else and i think collecting all the opinions in a central location like you are like you have is a valuable resource to people it's why i'm here <laughs> at least so i 100 second what you said awesome well thank you nate for for offering to be on this podcast and for sharing your unique journey and insights with us and and just being the role model that we all need <laughs> to keep investing in our continued education <laughs> in cybersecurity, but really making cybersecurity about, um, you know, protecting those who are close to us, right? It's about what, you know, is in your heart first yeah. and foremost to begin with. Absolutely. And thank you guys both so much for having me. <laughs> It's very, very, very nice to be able to sit sit around the table and kind of talk with with both of you about just stuff that I care about. There are very few people who will sit here and listen to me in this way. So I really do appreciate it. Um, you guys are both wonderful and wonderful people. Um, I, I really would like to get more involved with both of you. If, if you guys need anything at all, just please feel free to reach out. Um, I am literally a phone call away. So For sure. I, I do connect people with mentors a lot. So yep. um, now they know you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just you. shout, just shout I'm here. Um, there's a there's a Calendly, Calendly link on my LinkedIn. Um, so if you actually do, if someone here is listening to this and wants to talk to me, you can. Uh, just put it on my calendar. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> well, maybe Antonio, you can pick him up on that. Offer. Yeah, yeah. I have, uh... Go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, well, thank, thank you. you so thank much. you again. Thank you for your service also. Yeah, appreciate you. Very much. Thank you so much.